government operations on Wednesday, I believe, um, the 26th of August. So we're going to, um, we've been asked by appropriations to do a couple things, but first what I want to say is that I know that these, um, the way we are having to do these meetings is seems a little odd to people who are out there watching. And it, it does mean more people can actually watch the proceedings without having to drive to Montpelier. But it also means that it's a little bit harder for people to be able to kind of testify and let us know because they're not really in the room. So I would say that if on any of these issues, if there are people who feel that they really want to testify about something or have something to add, please contact Gail and myself and, and we'll um, find out what it is and get you into some uh, meeting at some point when we deal with the issues because we do want to hear from everybody. Um, so, and you can find both Gail, Gail is G Kerrigan at leg.state.bt.us and I'm Jay White at the same address. So, okay. So with that, we've been asked by appropriations to look at the uh, CRF funding and how that, there was a list of questions there. Did everybody get that list of questions? It was, um, yeah. did the money go out? How much of them, well, first of all, were there any issues setting up and administering the, the program itself? And then did the money get out? How much money got out? How many recipients? Is there money left over? And uh, so what was the kind of the total expenditures projected? And is there money left over? And if so, how, what is the plan for getting that money out to people? And then um, kind of any other issues that um, you think we need to address either now or um, in the future and how we can be helpful and keep an accounting of that. So does that make sense? So we thought we would, um, we have in our charge EMS, the digitizing program, the municipal, um, municipalities, uh, secretary of state, I don't know that they had any funds to administer, um, DPS and the training council if they had any, but we thought today we would start with, uh, start with the EMS program and how, what money, there was there and how it's been handled. So I guess, is that you, Dan, or is there somebody else that's going to speak to that? Uh, it certainly can be me. Uh, however, I would welcome anyone else who'd like to chime in as well. Senator um, White? Yes. Uh, Doug Farnham has some time constraints and he oh. was hoping to be able to testify before two. Oh, I'm okay. Sorry. I did. Sorry, I did. I was trying to get that message to you. Thank you. Okay. I didn't, I didn't know that. So Dan, I'm sorry. I'm going to bump you. No problem. Happy to yield. Okay. And go to Doug to talk about the digitizing of land records program and how that worked and is the money getting out and all that, all those questions. So Doug. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, for the record, Doug Farnham, Deputy Commissioner, Department of Taxes, and thank you, Dan, uh, for being gracious. I apologize for, for the last minute shuffle. Um, so, Madam Chair, do you want me to just focus on digitization and not the local government expense reimbursement program or talk about both programs? Well, I, it's, it, we're gonna kind of um, separate it into the, to the digitizing okay. and then the municipality. But if you wanna address both, if you have time to address both before you leave, then um, that, that would be fine. Okay, so I'll start out by walking through digit digitization. And by the way, um, the number of times we have tried and failed to say that word over the last two months is massive. Um, <laughs> luckily, it's easier to type. Uh, so the setup, the first question uh, that we received was um, setup. Did we encounter any issues with launching the application? Um, the answer to that is no. Actually, we were able to create a very simple application in Microsoft Forms and make that available to the towns. Um, I believe we had it uh, available within two weeks of the bill being made into law. And um, so we feel like we did a, a good job getting that application up and available. One reason it was up quickly is because we made it a very simplified application. Um, 
And that is because um, in evaluating how we were going to be able to issue these grants, we determined that um, applicants would need to be able to um, complete a project for digitizing their land records by November 1st. And that in order to reimburse them from the, uh, the, corona, um, the CRF, the Coronavirus Relief Fund, we would need to have documentation of the money that they spent uh, prior to actually giving them the grant. We could award the grant up front through a simplified application, then receive documentation um, later on and uh, complete the disbursement for the grant. So that leads me to question two, the funding, how much of the funding has been sent to recipients? Um, because we're doing this as an application award and then um, disbursement after documentation is received, we haven't dispersed to any uh, projects yet. But we have had 45 towns apply, which is actually um, excellent news. To be honest, it exceeds um, the number that I thought would be able to apply. Uh, the word on the street is that some of the vendors involved with this have really started to step up and try, starting to move much more quickly to try to make sure towns can, can uh, take advantage of this. We initially went out with a $20,000 uh, cap on the grant, and that was to make sure that at least 100 towns could apply for this grant. We wanted to make sure that, um, that it wasn't consumed by larger towns and that we, we uh, offered the uh, opportunity to as many towns as possible across the state. It's looking like um, with those 45 applications in that $20,000 cap, $795,523 has been requested under the cap. If you pull in removal of that cap, which in our guidelines early on, we said there's a $20,000 cap, but please tell us your total expected expense. We will remove the cap if we are able. And that is at 996633 So with a little over about a week to go in applications, we're pretty confident we're going to be able to remove that $20,000 cap. And it's a certainty that we'll have less than a million encumbered at this point. And it's just a matter of seeing, okay, how much less than a million uh, will remain unencumbered. Um, and then, um, sorry, lost my train of thought there. So uh, that covers the, how much is committed, how many, uh, the, when these funds will be sent. Between September 1st and September 15th, we're going to be reviewing the applications further. We've already been taking a look at them, but um, we're, we'll be taking, walking through them and issuing award letters between September 1st and 15th. Uh, we hope to have all the award letters out by the 15th. That's our target date. After that, as soon as a town finishes a project, they can submit for, um, for the disbursement for the grant award. Uh, and that would cover 100% of their, of their project cost, uh, provided the $20,000 cap is indeed lifted. Uh, now, the nice thing about the way we're approaching it is the award amounts can be amended if they're if the cap is lifted, especially if there's additional funding, if their expenses come in higher than the additional application, um, we, we can adjust that, but we've asked towns, you know, if anything, highball your request a little bit so that, um, so that we don't have an issue where your expenses exceed your, your award amount. Um, so that program has been going pretty well. Um, happy with the vendors, happy with the towns. I know that they had a very difficult election day this year. So the fact that the towns were able to participate in this program at the same time as dealing with, with the election issues is, is quite impressive. Um, after the 15th, probably around September 15th, we'll know how much we have uncommitted. And then at that point, um, it would be a question of, I, I personally don't think reopening the application for this particular program would make a lot of sense. Um, we can check with the communities to see if there's, we do intend to send out a blast email right before the first. And I think our director of PVR actually recently sent out an email, maybe this morning, reminding towns that this, this opportunity was out there. So I think the word is out. I think that the towns that are able to participate are, and that because it's a simplified application, it only takes 
five to 10 minutes to, to submit the application. Um, because we're not asking for that documented exact figure at this time. And um, I think most likely uh, we'll be looking at a situation where those un, uh, unencumbered funds, it would make sense for those to be eligible to be, to be allocated somewhere else by the legislature. Um, because we're covering 100% of expenses, I don't think we could be more generous uh, in this particular program, I, it's not possible. Uh, so, can I interrupt you a minute there? Of course, Madam Chair. You you said that without the cap, it amounted to about nine hundred ninety six thousand dollars. Didn't we allocate it a million? Is that right? Apologies, Madam Chair. That that program is two million. Two million. So we have a million left unencumbered at this point. Got it. Okay. Okay. And. As I said, the towns have already exceeded my expectations as far as who's applying for this. I'm very, very happy with how it's going. So um, I, don't, I don't know how many more can take advantage. We only have three or four vendors in the state that, can, mm -hmm. that are really doing this activity. So I, I would be of the opinion we've probably reached um, about critical mass. Uh, but, you know, I've already been surprised once in the last several weeks. So it could happen again. Great. Thank and, you. Any uh, questions about that? Or, or did you have more um, on the digitizing? Just one thing, Madam Chair, uh, just for context, we have right around 40 towns right now that have digital land records. Mm -hmm. So this is actually doubling, um, not the amount of records, but the amount of locations um, with digital access, which I think is a, is a huge victory in the current environment. Okay. Any questions about the digitizing? And then we'll have uh, Doug talk about the municipal grants. But if there's any questions or comments about the digital first, I'm watching his mm -hmm. time. Allison? I, I think if we can double this with 2 million, I would hope that we could consider going into the future, figuring out a way to double it every year. I mean, that's still only 85 towns out of 251. So uh, it's as great, you're absolutely right, to double it in this short time period is fabulous. But wow, it, uh, we clearly have our work uh, cut out for us continuing this. Yeah. So uh, Jill, did you have anything that you wanted to add about that? No, thank you. Okay, hey, thanks. And um, Karen, did you have anything you wanted to add about that? Where are you? There you are. You're muted. Um, no, I, I don't have anything to add. I think that's, that's amazing. We had actually heard uh, a lower number just on Monday. So um, the applications must be coming in at quite a good pace right now. Carol? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, uh, Karen, to your point, I submitted our application for Barry City yesterday, so <laughs> we're we're one of the newer ones. Um, and I will say that that uh, that that forty five number um, does include some communities like Barry City that are already digitizing, but are using the grant funds as an opportunity to extend our records back to the forty years, which is covered under the grants. Um, I've been pushing over the last couple days out to the list serve, particularly after I submitted my application and saw how easy it was encouraging clerks to apply. I know there's a lot of clerks out there that are still exploring what options would be available to them. So um, I would hope that that number will grow maybe by as many as another five to 10 um, between now and Monday. Good, thank you. I think that's very encouraging and I'm glad to see that you made it um, a pretty simple and uh, user-friendly application process. So, hey, do you wanna to talk to us about the other municipal grants? Yes, Madam Chair. Uh, so the local government expense reimbursement um, or ELGR as we've taken to calling it, um, cause we can't resist putting an acronym on something at tax. Um, <laughs> So as far as the setup goes, we followed a very similar approach. Um, we 
we prioritize the digitization applications first because we had a deadline there for publishing guidelines. It was, it was also viewed as much more time sensitive because, um, because the towns need to put in a project and actually accomplish the work this year, um, we put that in front of the line. So the local government program, uh, the application for that was put up, uh, I believe, a week later than the than the digitization application. Very similar. I think one thing to note in the application process, and one reason I believe we only we only have eleven applicants right now with two hundred eighty nine thousand requested. One reason is, um, you know, it, the application hasn't been up as long. This application is much broader because it's covering, you know, um, both, you know, what you've actually incurred up to this date and an estimate of what you expect through the end of the year as far as coronavirus related expenses. But also there's the question of, have you applied to FEMA? And as soon as we knew that that was going to be a a requirement to, to re apply to FEMA before applying to the, the local government grant program, uh, we put a blast out to the listserv, but again, municipalities are incredibly busy right now. So I think that additional step of having to consider what you're applying to FEMA for and then applying to this program, it's causing uh, applicants to have to walk through a bit more and to do a bit more work before they fill out our application. Again, we kept it as simple as possible with that same model of kind of line items uh, where you're talking about what you've incurred and what you estimate for the remainder of the year. And, and then later on after the documentation for those actual expenses is submitted, then we would do the disbursement. So it, the two programs were built with a very similar model. Um, so at this point, we haven't sent any funding uh, and the application uh, period is open through September 4th. And we know that that's a bit tight. It was slightly under a month of an application period when we posted the application. And uh, we understand it's a bit tight. And um, I think that's one of the aspects we're keeping an eye on and would need to evaluate if, if we do need to extend the application period. Um, I think that is, of course, an option. Could I ask a, if, about FEMA? Because I know that um, your application process might be pretty simple and user friendly, but FEMA is, is far from. And I, just one of the uh, things that I'm dealing with at where I work is that um, we applied to FEMA and were told that because, if, because we had a cleaning contract to clean, you know, to just do general cleaning of the buildings that the, ex, the extra expenses, like the deep cleaning and cleaning all of the um, common rooms and all of that kind of stuff, we couldn't apply for because we already had a cleaning contract, even though it was $100 and we'd spent $900. Right. So is there any way of allowing towns to apply at the same time they're applying to FEMA so that during that time when they're trying to deal with FEMA and getting all this runaround, they can actually have put in, also put in an application with you to meet the deadline? Yes. They don't need to have successfully finished the application process okay. with FEMA, but we need to know the town has applied to and is working on that application with FEMA. And we have been working with um, uh, Vermont Emergency Management, I believe it is. Jill can correct me if I got that wrong. Um, but the process would be if there are elements of your FEMA application that you were counting on for FEMA and you, so you didn't put them in our application, that can be rolled into our application when you learn that FEMA is disallowing those uses. Like for example, with that cleaning contract, I think most people would think that the additional expense would automatically count. Mm -hmm. And that certainly would count for our program um, because we're looking at the actual numbers, not whether or not a contract existed in the past. Uh, but additional expense. Um, so navigating that interaction with FEMA is, is, um, is certainly a challenge. I don't want to understate it, um, but we're trying to make it so that if there is a, if there is a determination from FEMA and it's, and it's a, and it's an expense that we believe is coronavirus related, we are going to roll that into our grant application. So we will allow for um, adjustments to that, that uh, grant award up to, of course, the statutory caps that were placed in Act 137. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and that's the controlling mechanism there that makes it so that the towns, um, I think worst case would be looking at a 75% proration. Um, if every town out there applied for the maximum amount, uh, which we know isn't going to happen, um, then it'd be a 75% proration. So in my opinion, proration of, of that $12.6 million in grants is, is unlikely to be necessary. Um, and if it did occur, it'd be very minor. Any um, questions, Brian? Thank you, Madam Chair. This might be a better question for Betsy Ann, but I'm not sure. Doug mentioned that the application deadline for the municipal grants, I think you said it was a week from tomorrow, September 3rd. Uh, apologies for local government. It's September 4th for the digitization. It's okay. September 1st. Yes. So it's a week from Wednesday or a week from next, whatever. Um, my question is, was that set in statute or session law, or is that something that you could change if you needed to? Uh, Senator, we can certainly, um, extend that application, uh, due date. Um, so it's not set in statute, but of course there was an imperative from both the legislature and the governor to, uh, get this money out, um, as quickly as possible. Um, so I think that how many applications we've received by September 4th would dictate whether or not we just extend that application period, or, uh, I think if we have more than enough money left to go, uh, left in the $12.6 million appropriation, then we could continue accepting applications and work on processing the full payment, you know, get issuing full awards. We just don't want to issue full award amounts. If it turns out later, we're going to have to prorate that. That is not a conversation we want to have to have with anyone, uh, letting them know they're going to get less money than they actually, we told them they would receive already. Okay. But it's good to know that you could, you're set up control of your own destiny in terms of the deadline date. We do appreciate the flexibility the legislature gave us in that area. Okay. Thanks, Doug. Any other questions for Doug on that one? And I'm aware that you have one minute left, so. So Karen, do you want to just um, comment on on this and what they're yeah, really going to promote? Thank you. Uh, so we held a webinar on August 19th, which amazingly was just last week. Um, and I, I sent the webinar to Gail and to you, Madam Chair, and, and maybe it could get posted. And it was explaining the what the all the grant programs available to municipalities entailed. Jill Remick was on there. Kim Kenarecki from the um, Vermont Emergency Management and some other folks. We had 120 people um, on that webinar, so it was very well attended. The other thing I wanted to mention is that um, given the interaction between FEMA and um, the Elger, I think it should be a soft G, Elger, that sounds better. Anyway, um, that there were, there are 140 applicants registered with FEMA to date. Not all of those are municipalities. My understanding is about 80 of those are municipalities, but it's a kind of a two-step process. First you register and then you actually submit your application. And according to Kim, again on Monday, there were um, 40 who had actually submitted their applications already. So I think that the timing is a little bit slower of necessity with this program, but there's definitely a high level of interest. Uh, it's also, as, as you said, FEMA is much more of a pain in the neck than um, anything the state is gonna put together. So there's that hurdle to get over. But we're per probably pretty confident that we can get enough. I mean, not, if 40 have already put them in and there's another 40 out there who've registered, though, those people will be in a good position to send in their applications to the state. Right. And, and just one other um, consideration is that if you have less than $3,300 in COVID-related expenses, you're not eligible for FEMA funding. So you would go directly to the Alger program. 
um, for those reimbursements. And, and I don't know if there's any of those folks um, in the pipeline yet. Okay. Any more questions for Doug or comments? Okay, well, thank you. I think you're getting out of here just about on time. Thank you, Madam Chair. I truly appreciate the opportunity and the, the flexibility. Um, and thanks for working so fast and so hard on these. Well, um, it was primarily Jill Remick and her team that, that did a lot of the work, so. Um, well, and I see she's gone, I think, so thanks, Jill. <laughs> she must be working oh, on something else. Oh, no. she is, I don't see her, but okay. All right. Thank you. Um, all right, so we can move to to um, EMS, thank you. <coughs> so Dan, do you wanna, Dan, are you the person that's gonna mainly talk to us or I'll do, we'll just turn it over to you and let you um, handle it from here on in. Okay, that's fine, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, ours is a bit of a work in progress. And uh, as you know, we we've, we've have several different areas of funding that were, uh, were given to us. Uh, the biggest chunk of uh, funding was for EMS education. That was given to us in two, in two uh, buckets, if you will. Uh, the first was $500,000 for paramedic education. Um, uh, I'm very happy with the progress we've made there. Uh, what we've done with that funding is to create um, uh, essentially a voucher program for students to apply and take uh, emergency medical services licensure programs. In the paramedic program, we have uh, right now currently 27 uh, completed applications for paramedic training uh, with a, a cap. Uh, if, if, we, if we measure it as uh, the standard tuition for Vermont Technical uh, College, our cap is about 28. Oh. Now, uh, not all of those paramedics are applying to VTC. Uh, and some of the programs that they're applying to have a little bit of a lower uh, tuition. So we may have the ability to put more than 28 on and we've created a waiting list. Um, we've had probably somewhere in the order of about 35 to 40 inquiries, including those applications. Uh, so uh, we've been adding people in as we go. So I'm anticipating that we'll have an even higher number of paramedic applica applicants before we finish off uh, this that bucket of money so very pleased with that that's going to put a lot of new uh, advanced life support provider, providers in the street and i think it's an injection that's uh, long overdue so uh that's great um the challenges with that one uh that we're still dealing with a little bit uh, there are really two elements that need to happen in order for us to process that funding the first is that the programs need to be approved now vermont technical college has no problem they've been approved vermont ems program for a long time. There are about four other programs that students have applied to that uh, are either out of state or are, are, not, uh, are not previously approved by our office. Um, it's a, a very minor hurdle that we just jump over. There's a national accreditation process that we're just double checking on, but we've had some communications that have to kind of go back and forth to get those documents and all that. The second element is that uh, in order for uh, the programs to invoice us, they have to become a vendor of the state of Vermont, which is not entirely complicated, but does require several communications back and forth with uh, college and school administrations and all that. So, uh, but we don't anticipate any of those to be a major hurdle and we, uh, we feel like that's gonna go smoothly. We're still in the process of, of squaring that away, uh, but uh, for any of the, uh, in, any of the uh, approved students thus far, we're ready for the, for the programs to invoice us at any time and disperse that funding. The second bucket of money was $400,000 for EMT, EMR, and AEMT training. We've had a little less success with that. Uh, right now we have uh, a, about 35 applicants um, and probably somewhere in the order of about 50 inquiries. Um, I think there's a few challenges with regard to this one. So we did st set up a, a statewide hybrid EMT program, uh, and that is actively accepting applications. Uh, they have three cohorts ready to go between now and the December 31st deadline. So that's, that's 
poised and ready. But the challenge that we've seen, I think, is that uh, we just don't have the programming that we ordinarily would have uh, because of the COVID-19 response. University of Vermont uh, announced today that they're not going to run any of their outside EMT programs this year. They usually account for, you know, in this fall semester, they're good for at least four classes, uh, if not more. Uh, they're going to do class. They're going to do programming for internal full-time students, but not for the local districts. So that's a pretty big challenge. Uh, I think we're also finding some challenges with uh, uh, hospitals allowing our students in the clinical. There, there's some significant hurdles there to keeping that local programming at a level that we would normally expect it to be. Now, um, I, I will say that that 35 number is a really dynamic number and we're gonna do our best to keep marketing it and pushing it and doing whatever we can. And with the, with the, number, of, uh, app, uh, with the number of inquiries, I, I would not be surprised to come back in three weeks and say that we've doubled or tripled that number uh, and uh, it's just a little hard to predict because of that. We have a lot more capacity in the hybrid class. The hybrid class can take up to 100. I think right now they're somewhere at, uh, you know, in the 45 to 50 range. So we have more capacity if we can get that pushed out. But um, uh, I think some of the other programs that normally would be there are just are not going to be there necessarily. So uh, I don't have a great sense of exactly how much of that funding we're going to be able to push out the door, but we're going to do our ever loving best. Uh, to do what we can uh, and get as much of it uh, uh, spent as we possibly can. So those are the two big ones. Uh, can I stop you here and ask if there are any questions about those two before we jump to next one? And if um, anybody on the committee has questions and then and then I'd like to go to Jim and Drew, but Anthony, did you have a question? And yeah, just, I was just wondering why the UVM thing is not gonna, not happening. Is there a reason why UVM is not going ahead with these other things? Or is it... Yeah, uh, so, so I wanna be pretty clear that I'm not speaking for UVM. Um, sure. What they've told us is it's just the COVID-19 restrictions that they have on campus and allowing uh, non full-time students on the campus and their, you know, it, it relates to the to the COVID nineteen response that they're dealing with. Okay, so it's trying to limit contact with people coming onto the campus who are not really a part of the campus. Uh, it's, it's a bit of an assumption on my part, but I would think that that's a fair assumption. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Allison. Um, uh, Dan, how many? Thank you for this. How many had you hoped for? What 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 was the number that you were hoping for yeah. for applicants? So, Thank you, Senator. Um, the uh, we'd hope to spend all of the money, right? I mean, we hope to 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 right. drain every nickel out of the bucket that we can, because the reality is, it's not about spending money; it's about putting EMS providers on the street. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. for every every dollar we spend, it's one more person that's answering a call somewhere, and that's ultimately what we want. Right. Um, I, I hope that we could fill that hybrid class at a hundred. You know, that would put us. Um, uh, in, in a pretty good place. Uh, and, and again, I also want to be respectful that, that not every student is going to be capable of taking that hybrid class and online experience. Um, we want to support the additional programs that we have out there with this money. We've certainly had a lot of inquiries from both in-state and out-of-state programs. Uh, and we want, you know, as long as it's a quality program that, that Vermont EMS can approve, we're happy to push students in every direction. But I think most places are seeing that very similar pinch that 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 they are locally here in Burlington with the UVM. It's just challenging. Schools aren't letting uh, us use the spaces that we normally would use. Again, hospitals are having difficulty with clinical. Um, it's it's a complicated time right now to to get EMS education done. Right, and how and how are you marketing it? I mean, I just is there, yeah. there there's a great U, e, EMS network that is. Yeah, so that's a great question, and and we definitely need to do a better job on that. Um, and we we have some things in mind. What we've done is kind of what we've always done, which is to use our districts and to use our agencies to find those folks that are sort of inquiring. We post everything up on our website. You know, uh, it's the uh, historical pathway of, for almost everyone that's in EMS. The the methods that we used. Uh, I would suggest, though, that we probably could do a better job and try to get some communications out there to reach the folks that, that are not traditional. Uh, and it's something we've we've talked about a lot, but haven't quite gotten to yet. 
So, so Jim, I saw you had your hand up and uh, did you want to comment? Yes, thanks. Uh, on the EMT and AEMT and the uh, EC or EMR program, just to say that this information coming out and normally they have like 400 EMTs taught a year that it still is hard with the COVID going on, but the numbers will go up because I know there are many programs that are trying to figure out and be able to get it into place so that that number will go up. Okay, good, thank you. Drew, did you have a comment? You're muted. Is that better? Yep, better. Um, so just um, you know, some information to remind you that uh, we, we do lose on a typical year, um, you know, between four and 500 EMS providers. So um, just to kind of maintain our substandard staffing of the previous few years, uh, we need to get that uh, EMS education number up to uh, four or 500. And, you know, we've been, uh, we're way behind with the EMS education that was suspended in the early spring and uh, no ed EMS education being run over the summer months. Uh, we're, you know, way behind in kind of that, that make up and catch up that we typically see for EMS providers. So um, it, it is a little encouraging to, to hear about, you know, 40 people in an EMT class, but it's, it's far short of the 400 that we need just to kind of stay at, uh, at par. And that's not addressing the, you know, the, the workforce uh, crisis that we've been discussing for the last few years. So uh, I know that, um, you know, the announcement from UVM um, was kind of a, a big hit. You know, they were working on some uh, hybrid education as well as online or uh, on-campus education. And, you know, it's gonna leave a lot of people kind of scrambling over the next few weeks to figure out how to put education courses together. Um, but my, my hope is that we can, as a advisory committee, we can support those um, districts and services so that we can get that education out because we do need to get to that 400 mark. Yeah, and market. I mean, it sounds like you really need to market it more fully. What's the deadline for the applications for people? Senator, we'll take applications right up till the end of December. Uh, so we'll get as many of them in as we can. You know, the the, the other chat, and Drew's absolutely right. Um, I, I fully concur that we're in a in arrears here in terms of students. On an ordinary year, we train about six hundred students and about 150 to 200 come from UVM. Uh, now, again, be, to be clear, a lot of those students are not seeing the back of Vermont ambulances because they're UVM students, uh, but that's a big hit for us. Uh, and uh, it's something that we're taking pretty seriously. We are working with the district up here uh, to try to produce, to reproduce some of those course offerings. And I think we probably will be able to do some of that, but uh, it's a big challenge. It's a big challenge. And you're right, we do need to do more marketing. And, you know, the, the, of course, we can only market what's available. And that's that's also part of this problem as well. Are there, um, I might have missed this someplace, but are there, I know that some of the career centers have um, some level of programming. Is there any possibility of them just beefing up the programming a little bit and qualifying here? Sure. We've been working with the career centers for a long time. We have a very nice program going on up in uh, the Northeast Kingdom at the at the Newport um, Adult Education Center. Forgive me if I'm giving you the wrong name of the facility, but they have a very nice EMT program that runs up there on a regular basis. Um, we, we're happy to host an EMT class and to support EMS education wherever it can be done with a you know the right degree of quality, uh, and uh, we're we're happy to push it out as far as we can. So, I mean, just on that, what Jeanette just said and what you, that exchange, you know, marketing it through our career and technical education centers and our adult ed is a great, you know, that isn't already being done. It's a great thing for high school students to do too, because it, that helps keep them here if they have an additional bond to Vermont and are helping and, and coming in at an entry level on our EMS squads. That, you know, what a great, you know, additional lure to keeping them here. So I'm just, I'm gonna, um, Sarah, were you here? I, pardon me, but this hell ha happened so fast that I can't remember why you were coming. And then there's, an, I think, um, additional, a couple additional pots of money that Dan wanted to talk about, but I wanted to make sure that. Oh, sorry. 
Yes, um, thank you, Madam Chair. My name is um, Sarah Clark. I'm the Chief Financial Officer for the Agency of Human Services. I'm here in partnership with Dan. Okay. Uh, the $3 million was actually appropriated to the Agency of Human Services, um, 900,000 to be transferred to VDH, which has been done. And that's what Dan was just updating you on. And then the next, I think where Dan was probably moving next was the $2.1 million. Okay, thank you. I, that's what I thought, but I just wanted to make sure that I wasn't ignoring you. <laughs> thank you. So Dan, do you wanna? Absolutely. Um, so as Sarah mentioned, there was an additional $2.1 million. Uh, the 0.1 of the $2.1 million was uh, uh, earmarked for a single source uh, vendor to assist EMS agencies with uh, the completion of um, uh, grant applications and uh, assistance uh, uh, for COVID-19 uh, relief. Um, from we've been working with uh, uh, DFR to uh, to create to, to finalize that vendor. Uh, I understand that the contract has uh, is either in process or has been signed. It's Maybe been executed. Happened, but, okay. Um, so we now have an identified vendor. Uh, the next step of that. Uh, is to set up, uh, is to make the connections to the agencies. Uh, it's our vision, and, and we've been working with the EMS Advisor Committee on this as well, to match them up, uh, you know, so that they've selected a, a, a CPA firm, which is wonderful and, and a great resource to help these agencies sort out the financial elements of these applications. But the fact of the matter is we also have to give them the education about those grants and to help them navigate with a little bit more of the nuance of EMS. So uh, our vision and what we've talked about is to create uh, almost like a virtual conference, if you will, uh, where we can bring some of those resources in for our agencies. Uh, Jim Finger and I have talked about utilizing some of the folks from the American Ambulance Association. Uh, we have some, uh, uh, some resources to, to make that happen uh, and uh, offer that as a resource to, to connect some of those folks to the, the grants. I've also talked to Vermont Emergency Management and their folks who are managing a, a good number of these uh, COVID-19 relief funding projects uh, and to have them participate as well. And then at the, at the end, connect all of those folks with this vendor to help sort out those applications. So I would anticipate that's gonna happen very soon. We are waiting simply to get that contract executed and the vendor to be selected uh, and then we can move to this next phase. So I anticipate that will happen right away. Um, it's a little difficult to predict how much of that money will be uh, will be used uh, because it relies upon agencies stepping up and saying we need to use it. Um, and the stark reality that that we're we're faced with is the folks that pay attention closest uh, are the ones who've probably already applied to all these grants. Uh, and the ones that have the resources to, to, you know, to be present and to take these courses and, you know, all that are, they're the ones that are stepping up. So we're going to have to work extra hard to capture the ones who probably need it the most, but don't have the infrastructure to, to, to do that. So we're going to work on that. Um, uh, so it's a little hard to predict where we're going to end up with that. But uh, again, we're going to do our best to, to try to spend as much as we can of it. Is that um, an area where you work closely with the, uh... EMS advisory and all the yeah all the I mean it's out there certainly they have the expertise um, uh, that that they can offer us to to how to navigate this you know what we've tried to do from our office on a great number of issues is to connect right I mean that's uh, the, the 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 expertise and the experience of Drew and Jim we can't reproduce in a classroom and you know to the ability to to connect those folks to folks like Jim and Drew is really the important element here. They're the ones that can talk about their experiences and, and how to navigate this process. So yeah, we'll absolutely be involved with the advisory committee on this and certainly are wide open to any thoughts and suggestions they have on how to market this the right way. So remind me, who is it that would be eligible here and how do we reach those people who are eligible, but the least likely to, to um, have the resources and the, for whatever to to get in touch and apply. So it's a bit of a complicated question, Senator. And the only reason why is because it depends on what part of the relief they're going after. There's municipal grants, there's uh, employer grants, there's 
uh, nonprofit elements to this. Uh, and they're all a little bit different depending upon the makeup of the organization. Um, it's something that we've, that's challenged us a little bit to begin with, you know, for example, the hazard pay grant that came out was different for volunteers as it was for municipalities, as it was for nonprofits. Uh, and, you know, we've had to come up with three different solutions for three different types of organizations. So, um, uh, it's complex is I guess probably the answer that I'll give you, but at the same time, I think what we can try to do is connect some resources that have experience in all of those fields and work with the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. It's a part of our advisory committee as well to try to find and connect those resources as best we can. So just to follow up on that, just that little example that you gave about the firefighters, is, is that a, um, a legislative decision that created these kind of three different buckets and three different places to go. And if so, um, if not, then I guess we can't do anything. But if it was, is there a way of making it simpler so that there is one kind of bucket for hazard so that if you're a volunteer fire department that's connected to a municipality or not connected to a municipality or what, is there a, is, is there a legislative fix for this? So I should be I should be clear that I'm not an expert on that particular grant because we were not a part of the development uh, or uh, or procedural elements of that piece. I do know that there was some legislative purpose to separate municipalities away from other organizations simply because municipalities were eligible for hazard pay in another bucket of money uh, through COVID relief. Um, uh, I, I can't say what the other, how the other challenges came to be. I, I don't have enough experience working with that. Um, uh, but I, I think there are some legislative solutions, but I, I don't, I don't, I'm not exactly an expert in that circumstance. Sarah? Uh, yes, if I, if I may. Um, I believe as it relates to the hazard pay for essential employees program, there are some technical adjustments that are being discussed in the Senate um, related to that grant program. Do you know where what committee is it health and welfare that or is it appropriations or it appropriations is my understanding okay all right great yeah that's, that, that's my understanding as well senator i'm working on those with senator oh, there you are. yes <laughs> okay, so you are working with them on that yeah i've been working with uh senator kitchell uh and the pro tem and a couple other senators to work on those uh they don't include um any addition of the municipal employees at this point. So that would be something else that uh, you may want to discuss with Senator Kitchell if that's something you think is needs to happen. So uh, Damien, uh, Allison, just let me ask this first. Um, so our town, for example, has a volunteer fire department. Mm -hmm. They are considered a, a department of the town and they're in the, budget and we pay for well, we pay for a lot of the equipment um the town does and we pay for a stipend for the chief nobody else gets money sometimes they get a a per dia or a, a very small amount when they go out on a call and then they turn that back into the hose fund so mm -hmm. they don't really get money so that it's a volunteer fire department are, are they considered, so how do, how do they fit in here? Or in Guilford, it's completely, um, it's a volunteer fire department that's completely kind of removed from the town. How, and the same in Newbrook, Newfane, Newfane Brook, Brookline. So um, I, can, I can only speak to the, the essential workers hazard pay program which specifically excludes municipal employees. The reason it includes the uh, EMS is because there are some private EMS services in the state um, that aren't a municipal department. Um, the, I, I can't speak to Guilford um, and whether it uh, should have been included in the hazard pay program. Um, so, but what I can say is that my understanding as we were drafting this was that the bucket of money put into the municipal assistance bill was supposed to be 
used in part to cover any hazard pay and that it would be up to each municipality to determine how they were going to use that, whether they were going to provide some form of hazard pay, um, including for volunteer workers, it would presumably be a one-time lump sum bonus um, versus for uh, full-time professional firefighters and professional EMS and, and police officers, it would probably be um, something more tied to uh, either a bump in their hourly wage or some other, maybe a one-time bonus. So there would be different ways to do it. Um, but all of that was excluded from the actual hazard pay program because the municipal funding bill was also being done at the same time. But so in Putney, where we have one paid person and the others are all, all volunteers, they, mm -hmm. they're not town employees. They, they don't get a salary. They don't, they're not eligible for benefits, nothing like that. Why wouldn't they have been eligible for the hazard pay through the essential workers instead of their, through the municipal program? Because the, the definition of essential or of covered employer and the hazard pay program specifically excludes the state and all municipalities. But they're not municipal employees. Can we change that? And, <laughs> so they don't have an, they're, they're not. So the, the application in the hazard pay program is through the employer. So your employer has to choose to apply and then the employer pays, gets a grant to basically provide you with a hazard pay bonus uh, through their own payroll system. That's how that program works because of the, some of the administrative issues with the state sending checks to, uh, you know, over 10,000 workers. Um, so the idea was there that employers could apply directly. They would be in the best position to know which of their employees had been uh, working in close contact with the public um, versus which employees would be, uh, you know, working remotely or from home or in a location where they're socially distanced from everybody. Um, and then the decision was made somewhere early on to exclude the state and municipalities because of the other CRF dollars for public employees, or that could be used. Um, but I, I don't know anything more than just that that was a decision that was made and I was told to exclude state and municipal from the bill. Right. Well, you're only so. the messenger here, but I might talk to Jane about this because it does seem to me that the volunteer uh, firefighters and volunteer first responders and stuff are completely left out of this because they have no employer. Well, and they're... So the town isn't their employer. And so they have no employer They they work for the paper mill and they work for different places right. in their work, but they're not considered it, essential it, workers there. It, it's worth noting that um, a one-time sort of lump sum bonus would not lose them their volunteer status probably. Right. This yeah. is something, um, I mean, so it, there's nothing that, necessarily prevents municipalities from providing that sort of pay, except perhaps for uh, the fact that municipalities like uh, so many other folks right now are struggling just to uh, balance right. their, their checkbook. Um, so it, I guess I, I can't make policy proposals, but it would be possible to set aside grant funds for municipalities to provide a lump sum to volunteer uh, first responders. Um, and then we just would need to review the, the sort of labor rules around how to escape that line um, where you keep people as volunteers rather than employers. But uh, I'm fairly certain if my recollection is correct that you can do this with sort of uh, one time or, or non-regular payments um, where you get a bonus or uh, a little bit of a stipend to workers without making them actual, you know, employees who, where you have to follow the hourly wage laws and so forth. So um, committee, I, I think that we should um, have a little more discussion about this and we'll 
talk with Jane about, I, I don't know if the rest of you are hearing from your volunteer fire departments and. Um, yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And Anthony, I assume you are. Yes. So, I've been hearing from the EMT people. Right. So maybe what yeah. I'll do is a note to well, Jane from EMS people. And um, the volunteer, yeah, fire department EMS um, people and just see if there's a way of putting them in one bucket or the other to um, allow that to happen. Is that right? And I, I'm happy yeah. to work with Tucker to, uh, to get language set up for the municipalities so that they could, could get a stream of funding to provide those bonuses. Um, yeah, and I don't or care. Set up I'm some sort of. I actually don't care which bucket it comes from. It can come from the hazard pay bucket also. Whichever bucket seems to have the most unexpended um, or that might might be the most appropriate to do it because oh. of um, other other pressures on those funds. Yeah, I, I think hazard pay may be close to maxed out, if not maxed out already. Um, Sarah could definitely That's answer correct. that question. That's correct, Damien. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so we're, that, that will probably need additional funds anyway because the demand's okay. been greater than expected. Okay, so could Tucker and Damien, could you maybe just start, figure out this a little bit and see if we can then get it to Jane and. Yeah, if, if uh, you wouldn't mind just giving her a heads up um, I will. I'll, I'll and then, send her a note right away. Yeah, if, if she wants it in that bill, I can add it to that. Otherwise, Tucker and I can work on a standalone vehicle to get some funding um, out right. there. Um, and okay. New Hampshire has a model that could also work where the chief of the department uh, basically certifies the hours that uh, volunteers or department members worked. Uh, and then applies to the state for a lump sum that's then dispersed or for, it could be for individual checks too, potentially. But I think in New Hampshire, it's, it's done as a lump sum that the department then disperses. Okay. So. All right. Tucker, did you have a, your hand up? No. Okay. Are, so are there any other questions about the, um, the 2.1? That seems to be a little bit, um, uh, if there's anything we can do on that one, Dan and Sarah, around that, you should let us know about how we can get that out. Jim? Oh, Brian first. No, I was going to uh, advocate for Jim. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Jim? Thank you. I just want to say that we appreciate everything the legislature's done. This is very complicated for both the state and everyone to figure out. The hazard pay is very difficult for people. It was simple for the services that can have the payroll, know the hours, figure it out. The volunteer issue has been very much talked about. Appreciate anything can you can do for it. the municipal. Those departments can't apply themselves, so therefore they got to go through their towns. When you talked about the, the volunteers, it's very complicated to figure out their hours. And but but if there's a way. The Vermont Ambulance Association wants to help. We've made some contacts, but haven't got information back from those people. If there's somebody we can talk to on each of the grants that we can be an advocate for our, our services and try to give information, we want to help because we know you're doing the best, but, but we don't have the information to get back, which is the same on the 2.1 with the Dan talks about the HC Human Services, I think picking a contractor we want to have a lot, little input on that, work with it to get the information out. People haven't applied for the other two million because I don't think anybody really knows how to yet. So we want to be part of it. And if we could have contacts to each of it, uh, that would be so much helpful and be part of it. We'd appreciate it. Good. Anybody else have any um, comments or concerns or uh, Drew? So do we have, a, as far as I know, there's no application yet for the $2 million in ambulance uh, stabilization funds that we, um, I'm talking, I don't think that's been dispersed or uh, applied for at all yet. That's correct. So what's happening there? 
think that's what Dan was re referring to earlier. Oh, that's the point the, yeah. yeah, yeah, under development. Yeah, okay. So if you can work with Jim and Drew and people on getting that out and developing that. Yeah. It's, it's not a lot of funds, but just for the committee's awareness, I think uh, you're aware that the Agency of Human Services in the kind of immediate aftermath of the crisis stood up some emergency financial assistance programs for healthcare providers. There were, I believe, seven EMS providers that did receive funds from those programs, roughly $68,000. So not, not a lot of money. So um, I know this next phase of the program is very important. Good. Okay, anything else that anybody has to add on these? Thank you, and pretty soon um, next week, we're going to start looking at the governor's budget. So Dan, we might have you back in and um, whoever wants to come in and weigh in on the governor's budget and how it'll impact uh, your department, your agency, and Sarah, you wouldn't, um, I mean, we're not going to look at the Agency of Human Services budget, obviously, but we will look at uh, the EMS uh, budget and how the impact of the governor's budget and, on, on you. So I will send you a note next week, or we'll send it to you before next week. Any other questions or concerns? Thank you all for being here. Um, and Damien, I didn't mean to, you were just the messenger about that hazard pay stuff. <laughs> that's that's yeah. okay. It, Careful um, about being a messenger. <laughs> yeah, I've yeah, learned that over the years. It's the municipal <laughs> side that's been really screwed up because they also have to be employers that are willing to apply for it. So I look forward to more conversation about this. Yeah. Right, and it's I'm, I'm happy to... Uh, to try to help figure this out. Obviously, they're they've been putting themselves at extremely high risk, and um, yeah. so I'm happy to do what I can to help get the bill drafted for you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So I believe we're ready to move on to our next topic, unless uh, and we certainly welcome all of you to stay with us to talk about elections and an update on the elections and how that's going, but realize you probably have other things that you need to be doing. So thank you so much for coming. Okay. So who do we have with us? We have Chris and is Will with us by any chance or? Um, Will is not able to us, Adam. I can't hear you. Will's not able to attend today. Okay. All right. So you're going to give us, and I see we have Greg and Paul Burns and um, Thomas Wise is on the phone. So we wanted to hear um, a little bit of an update on how, where we are with the elections, what's happening, um, some of the issues around the um, spoiled ballots, or I don't know that they were called spoiled ballots, but the um, whatever they were called and what, how we're working, how we're doing toward the general election. And, um, and then as long as you're here, I don't know if you, if the secretary of state's office got any CRF funds. Yeah. They, or, and if it, you could report on those to us, if you have a chance, but let's start with the elections update. Okay, great. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good to, good to see everybody again. Um, Will Senning can't be here because he's been really burning the candle at both ends for a lot of weeks now, and yeah. um, he's got a number of things that he's doing today that I'll, I'll mention uh, as we talk about uh, prep for the general election. But um, sounds like it's uh, your plan. Maybe I could do a quick overview and, and debrief on the August 11th primary give you some some numbers on, on total turnout and defective ballots, what went well, what didn't, and, and things like that. And then I'll move into what we're doing to prepare for the general election. Okay, great. Does that sound good? Yep. 
All right, thank you. Um, I'll start by saying that the primary in August, oh, I did not identify myself for the record. I don't know if that, is that required anymore? If it's recorded and my name is underneath? Yes, it's required. I should it's, still say it for the audience. Some people do it and some people don't. <laughs> okay. And, and some people are listening and not seeing. Sure, well, in any case, my name is Chris Winters. I'm the Deputy Secretary of State and uh, happy to be here today with you all. Um, the primary in August really went as well as we could have possibly hoped, given the, the circumstances. You know, in fact, we're, we're calling it one of the most successful primaries that we've ever seen. We had record-breaking turnout. We had all of our resu uh, results reported on time. And we did all of that in the midst of a, a really challenging health crisis. And we were able to do this thanks to the law that you passed that allowed the Secretary of State, Secretary Condos, to issue temporary elections directives for 2020. So we put out the guidance and the options and your hardworking town and, and city clerks did the rest. They did an amazing job. We saw a lot of creativity and, and compassion on full display as the, the towns offered a lot of different options for their voters, ones that were right for their town. They offered drive up voting, including uh, one report of voting on horseback. Um, they, had, they had outdoor polling places. Uh, there was voting in hockey rinks and other polling place setups that I think made voters feel safe and confident in casting their ballots on election day. And we were able to do this and keep the polling places manageable by reducing in-person voting on election day. So even though we had record breaking turnout, um, we, were, we still had manageable polling places. Uh, this was accomplished by sending every active registered voter a postcard, and hopefully you all got one, with a postage prepaid tear off that you could send back to request your mail-in ballot. And I'll get into to those numbers around that uh, in just a minute. I, I think it's important to point out here that those postcards were multi-purpose. Um, first of all, it made it really easy to request your ballot and meant uh, much greater participation by mail and possibly much greater participation overall in this election. Uh, but secondly, these postcards serve to update our voter checklist and clean it up like never before, which will be important for our next mailing that's coming up soon for the general election. So on to the numbers. Last Tuesday, we held the primary canvas and certified the results. So the, the numbers I'm referencing now are the official numbers. We had 169,000 ballots cast, and that's a record by far. Our previous record was about 122,000 in a statewide primary. So 169,000 came out. And of those, over 123,000 voted earlier by mail. It's gonna be almost all by mail. There was very little early voting um, due to a lot of the, poll, the um, clerk's offices having limited hours due to COVID. So 123,000 voting by mail, that's about 70% of voters. And in previous years, we would see something around 25% of people voting earlier voting by mail. So that was way up. Um, Madam Chair, you mentioned one downside that we saw, one lesson learned, I think, from this election was that we saw around 6,000 ballots deemed defective. That's about a 3%, uh, about 3% of voters. Typically, we might see around 1% in previous elections of, of defective ballots. We think this was uh, due to a combination of things. This was a primary, our most, you know, so I'll use air quotes, complicated of elections, not terribly complicated, but the most complicated of the elections that we run, given that it's three elections in one for the three major parties. So the top three factors that led to defective ballots from the data that we have, um, one is people voted more on more than one ballot and didn't understand that they could only vote one ballot. Two, they failed to return the unvoted ballots and three, they failed to sign the certificate on the envelope. Those are all reasons for uh, considering a ballot to be defective. Uh, we also think there was a higher proportion, and we don't know this for sure yet, but we think there was a higher proportion of first time voters and first time mail-in voters. And those are also contributing factors. So on the good news side, more people were voting, people were voting for the first time. On the bad news side, there was 
um, some misunderstanding of the of the primary process. Um, the good, the other good news is that two out of those three reasons are not going to be an issue for the general election because there's only one ballot and there aren't three ballots. So we expect that percentage to go right back down again to what we would um, normally see in indefective ballots for an elections. Um, maybe I'll pause there and see, are there any questions about the, the primary before I move into um, what, what's happening for the general and what we're doing to prepare for the general? Brian? Thank you, Madam Chair. And hi, Chris, how are you? Good, thanks. Good. You mentioned that the postcards that were mailed out would act as, I think you said, a cleanup of voter lists. How exactly is that going to work? So if they were returned undeliverable, those go back to the to the clerks. Um, and, in, uh, and if someone receives one in error, they can call their town clerk and say, hey, this person doesn't live here anymore. Um, they were forwardable. So they, if they would follow people, if they moved to a different address, that would give them the heads up, like, hey, my address has changed. Call your town clerk, get your voter registration updated. Um, the ballots themselves that are planned for, it's an important distinction here, the ballots we'll be mailing out uh, for the general election will not be forwardable. So they're not gonna follow people into other states. Uh, they're not gonna follow people to other addresses. They're gonna be returned to sender, returned to the town clerk. So the town clerk will know uh, that that ballot did not reach the voter who it was addressed to. Okay, so I'll just give you my own personal example. I had three postcards mailed to my house here in Rutland. One was to me, one was to my son, and one was to my wife. My wife hasn't lived in Vermont for four years and has already voted twice in Florida in the uh, cycles down there. Will she still get a ballot uh, in November? Well, she will if her address is still there and she's still on the checklist as an active voter. What should have happened and perhaps didn't, appears not to have, um, is that Florida didn't notify us that she's changed her address or she didn't notify the town clerk that she has moved. Um, and we would hope that when those mailings go to, to someone like you, that you would let them know or you would let your wife know um, to contact the town clerk and update the voting information. Okay, so but it's still, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, yeah, you, purging someone from a checklist is a very careful process and has to be a careful process. Um, we need people to let us know. Uh, if we don't know, they're going to remain on there for a certain period of time until the BCA challenges them. And even then, they get a challenge letter and they get an opportunity to say, I'm still here, I'm still a voter, or say, no, I'm no longer a voter, take me off the checklist. So for the general, if they're still listed as an active voter, that ballot may still go. Um, but if they're not a Vermont resident, uh, if they're voting in somewhere else, those things are all illegal under Vermont law. They can only vote once and they can only vote in the state where they're the resident. So when I went to vote, being me, I asked whether my wife was still on the list and the person, you know, the clerk at the, at the polling place said, oh yeah, she is. And I said, well, she hasn't lived here for four years. Why don't we take her off? And of course she said, well, you can't do that. You have to have her do it. So it's still incumbent on the voter somehow to get the list purged, which I still see as sort of an issue. But anyway, um, that's my question. So but thank you. I have, couldn't, couldn't um, the town clerk in um, your town challenge, send a challenge letter and yeah. challenge her and if she doesn't um i mean now that you you've said that to them it seems to me it's incumbent on the town clerk to send a challenge letter and if she um doesn't respond to the challenge letter and say i'm still here then she would get booted off okay i think that's the way it works it allison so, uh, Brian, I also think you could you do something with that postcard and return it to the town clerk and do a change of address or whatever moved. But anyway, I, I'm uh, Chris, I our town clerks. Uh, I, I talked with uh, the Woodstock town clerk and his assistant 
and they thought it went very well. They felt that the so the postcard was too small and confused people and had a lot of information, which we knew that was going to be the case. Um, but they, they, uh, and there was, it was a pretty labor intensive uh, primary for them uh, on the whole, but they thought it went wonderfully. They thought the best option was the barcode on the return envelope, which was life-saving in terms of time. So they were they applauded that that piece and the option to close the uh, office the day before, which I would hope that they also will hope that that will be for the general election that helped them count. And that's part of why we got returns on time is that people were able to do that work uh, ahead of time. Um, and uh it was anyway it went very well and they were stressing the importance of promptly mailing things back um and the check they felt for the general election you know that the one ballot will help uh and that it's being mailed from you guys is super helpful we have a clear issue with elderly people being confused still and and we're going to need i think you might the sos's office might reach out to senior centers and assisted living facilities to really assist people uh, with this because they're not in COVID, they're not going to have the BCA come in and help people vote. So it's incumbent on those assisted living facilities, like where my mother is, to help. My mother had no idea what that postcard was. I mean, sadly, she didn't end up voting because of because of that. Um, but uh, they they felt that needed clarity. Also, there's evidently an issue with DMV and coordinating the check things with DMV at the moment. Uh, and towns are gonna need ballots for the general election because as people call and say, I've moved or we have new residents there, even though you're mailing it out, they're gonna, towns are gonna need their own set number of ballots for people who are gonna call and, uh, and, and need ballots who aren't already on the checklist or who have moved. Thank so, you, Those are good points. I'm gonna ask um, Carol and Greg and Paul if they have comments about the primary here before we move to the, is that okay, Chris? Of course. Okay. So Carol? Uh, yes, and taking a, a page from Chris, this is Carol Dawes, Barry City Clerk and Treasurer and Legislative Chair, of Vermont Municipal Clerk and Treasurer's Association. Um, for us, we were the ones who voted in our hockey rink, uh, in our field house. Um, it worked beautifully. The voters loved it. They loved the sense of, of safety by being able to stay in their vehicles. Uh, and yet we were undercover, which allowed us to have all our equipment set up in our, uh, our tabulator. We actually rolled tabulators up to their windows windows, they put their <laughs> ballots right into it. Um, it worked out perfectly. So um, while it certainly was a lot of work and we were kind of making it up as we went along, um, it went it went very well. Um, I did want to respond to Senator Collimore's questions about the, the postcards and Chris's comments um, with regards to the benefits of uh, changing addresses and updating the list. Um, we got back probably five, six hundred undeliverable postcards, um, which was a pain in the neck, but great because we were able to, after the election, go through them, um, identify the ones that we still have on our checklist as active and living in the community and send challenge letters out to them. And that changes their status in the system to challenged, which means they will not be getting a ballot unless they respond to our challenge letter and get reactivated. Um, and I know that there were a lot of clerks around the state who are in the same process. Uh, so I, I, I agree that it's helping us get the lists cleaned up. Um, many of us, myself included, have also put out uh, calls weekly on Front Porch Forum asking people to go into the system, which they can do through the My Voter page uh, on the Secretary of State's website uh, and update their information. And I'm getting notifications through the system daily uh, about people who are making those updates. Um, so again, we're, we're really using this as an opportunity to get the list as clean as is possible. Thank you. Um, Paul, do you have any comments? 
Yes, uh, thanks so much, Madam Chair. Nice to see you uh, and the rest of the committee again. Um, for the record, Paul Burns, I'm the Executive Director of VPIRG, the Vermont Public Interest Research Group. Um, I, I want to say, um, as others have, that uh, we are tremendously appreciative of uh, the Secretary of State, Secretary of State staff, the work that they have done. It's really um, a huge amount of work, and it has been done in, an, in a really excellent way. I thank and congratulate this committee uh, and your colleagues in the legislature for giving the Secretary of State the authority to move forward in the way he and the staff have done there. And um, also, um, tremendously grateful to the work at the local level um, by the clerks and the other poll workers. And, you know, just in a difficult time with an awful lot of work, uh, things were done incredibly well uh, from my perspective here. So thanks to all for helping to make that possible. Um, I have just a couple of uh, thoughts or questions. Uh, um, and I, and I, I recognize that um, Despite all best efforts, there are still, you know, it's still a, an unfortunate thing when 6,000 people have attempted to vote and their um, ballots are not counted because they were defective. There are presumably a number of others who sent in ballots, but they were received too late to be counted. And that's, a, that's an additional problem of some number of people who were unintentionally disenfranchised um, uh, because of the way they participated in the process. And certainly if they sent in a ballot, you know, uh, closer to the election than seven or eight days, uh, they were doing so against the advice of the Secretary of State and, you know, local clerks and others. But that seems to me, you know, is going to happen. And so that remains a question out there. I'd be very interested to know what that, uh, what the data show there for how many of those ballots came in too late. But my understanding from the Secretary of State's office is that we won't know that for sure for a, about 60 days post primary. Um, and so that, uh, but, it, but it kind of relates to what we might want to do uh, looking forward toward the general election. Um, even if a regular spoilage rate or let's say a defective ballot rate is closer to 1% than 3%, and I, and I totally agree that's a reasonable assumption to make that it would be lower uh, in the general than the primary because you don't have those additional ballots and that there was a, a, a somewhat more complicated process there. Uh, that would still be on the order of 3,000 people in a general election. Um, and uh, because you're, you're going to have roughly 300,000, maybe more, we hope, uh, people participating in the general election in leading up to November's election day. So um, we may never get to a place where that number is zero defective ballots. I understand that, um, despite our best education efforts and everything else, but um, we should strive to make it as close as possible to zero. And I think there is work that we can all do as part of that. But one thing that we are interested in is the process by which individuals might be able to cure a defect if they take advantage of mailing something in early and discover that uh, perhaps they didn't sign the envelope, for instance. Um, easily curable if they are allowed to potentially come in in a safe way and sign that um, uh, envelope in front of whomever they may need to at the, sec at the um, town local town clerk's office, for instance. Um, I. I'm not suggesting, though, though in a perfect world it might be that clerks would be required to reach out to somebody who sends a ballot that is defective in a way that could be cured. And there I'm talking about a missing signature as opposed to somebody who fills in every single oval on the form. There's nothing, I don't think there's anything you can be done about that except giving them a do-over and I don't think that's uh, going to be something that we would want to do. But for those where the cure is, gosh, I just forgot to sign the thing, and there's time and it's possible, uh, we'd love to see that person have the ballot count. Um, and, uh, and, and yet, as I say, given this year and everything else the clerks are dealing with, I don't know that it's reasonable to assume or to think that the Secretary of State should require that of clerks. But if it could be, uh, if at least you know, people now have the technology to track their ballots and, and see, did it get to the uh, town clerk? And, you know, where is it in the process? And might even be able to learn that if for some reason it has been considered defective, what if they then could be encouraged to call the clerk and see what, what was the defect or is there a way that it could be cured? 
I guess all I'm saying here is that maybe short of requiring the clerks to reach out, we could just do a little more public education about the possibility of a voter uh, curing a, a, a potentially defective ballot in that way. Maybe the Secretary of State could do more education. Maybe the clerks could be encouraged to do something like that too. And maybe you can encourage clerks to reach out, but not require that of them. I, I don't know honestly what the perfect answer is. I know some states allow this uh, uh, activity in terms of curing defective ballots and, and others don't. Um, but any, if there is anything that could be done in a situation, it just seems unnecessarily kind of tragic if somebody goes to the effort to fill out the thing and send it in beforehand and then find out that they forgot a simple thing like signing the envelope. So that's one thing that we might be able to do uh, even for this general election uh, time. I don't think that's, by the way, anything that would require legislative activity. I think there is a question about uh, just how the Secretary of State's office may approach this and how the clerk's uh, office uh, or clerk's offices might approach that. So that's one. Uh, the other goes to that question of uh, might we consider allowing voters to have right up until election day to send in the ballot and have it postmarked as of election day. 17 states, I believe, allow this now. Um, and it, it is, uh, there are challenges with that. Um, and I understand that. But my greatest concern is trying to find a way for people to not be disenfranchised. And again, because elections sometimes see great activity leading right up until election day, um, I can't imagine that there aren't some people out there who will ultimately get their ballot in the mail too late for it to be counted. And that may be a particular problem because of all the challenges with the post office and the uh, uh, the administration in D.C., you know, some of their cutbacks and so forth. I don't know that those uh, that we will see negative effects on the uh, post office ability to move our mail, uh, particularly the ballots. Uh, but with all that kind of out there as uh, as background noise. Um, our position is that it would be great to give voters um, the greatest possible time to get those ballots in. If you did allow postmarks up to election day, I still believe that you would need some sort of cutoff uh, for them to be actually received by the clerks in order to be counted. And that might be an additional three days, for instance, in Vermont, that should be generally speaking, plenty of time for a ballot to actually reach the clerk. Um, there are there are things that that would then um, necessitate, which might be you know delays in um, in certifying the uh, elections, et cetera, et cetera. Delays in recounts, delays in, in other things. Um, all of that is true. Um, it's an imperfect world, but uh, I'm just suggesting that in order not to disenfranchise or to prevent the disenfranchisement of a certain number of voters, um, we should at least consider very carefully something like that. Um, so I think those are my main uh, thoughts. Um, I just point out again that if we have more than 300,000 people participate in the general election, uh, and perhaps perhaps significantly more than that, given the turnout for the primary, that's at least another 130,000 people participating um, in the um, in, in the elections process. And uh, if at least 70% of them are participating. Uh, by mail, you know, sending their ballots in by mail. That's uh, again, uh, well over 100,000 more ballots coming in through the mail than we saw for the primary. And um, most of those people probably will not have used the vote by mail process before. So again, totally agree all the education that in the world that we can do, but these are a couple of other ideas that we hope will, will be helpful. And I will just finally note that VPIRG is among the different organizations trying to help do some education around this as well. We put out uh, video and lots of other educational pieces uh, to our members and the broader public and shared with coalition partners. And so I think that work is gonna be important. And we have a, a Vote Safe uh, Vermont Ambassadors program where people are trying to identify several other folks that they will remind to vote and to vote early. And so these are all ways that I think civic organizations can help uh, in the process as well. So thanks very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Um, see, I'd like to hear from Greg first, and then maybe the um, Chris could respond to the couple of the suggestions that were made. 
Thank you, Madam Chair, members, uh, members of the committee. I'm Greg Marshallden. I'm the AARP Vermont State Director. And again, uh, thanks for inviting me to join this uh, important hearing. Uh, I echo uh, much of what, what, what Paul said. I want to thank Chris, the Secretary of State, Chris, the team. We've been working closely with them. This is a huge uh, a job that they have taken on, and they have taken it on with extreme professionalism and looking at this very, very carefully. We've been really pleased with our ability to collaborate with them and their understanding of sort of the large swath of ARP members that we're working with across the state. So I have nothing but high praise for the secretary's office and again for this committee for uh, pushing this and making certain that we were gonna be able to have a safe and secure election uh, in 2020. We did not, ARP did not engage our members in the primary. Um, it was a little late for us to jump in. We're sort of large enough with the complexities of our organization that getting stuff out quickly was not something that we were able to do. We, um, we have heard back um, from members. We reached out uh, through email change and asked how that experience was. Mostly what we've received back is uh, it went well. Um, voting by mail was a uh, absentee and voting by mail was a good thing. People did have some questions. I'm sure that some of our members are amongst the 6,000 um, in the primary voting when they're, and it is, as we've said, a bit more complicated uh, than what's coming up in the general election. Um, and I, I think also what, I, what we heard from Carol is something that we've been asked about and we haven't been able to sort of provide answers yet and we will when there's concrete ones but the voting in the hockey rink people are, are certainly some of our older members are definitely looking for that to be an option if if it's possible in a community where it's larger and safer uh, as one of the options they may have to vote in the general election i just want to just brief the committee um, and let you know sort of what we have done and what we're going to continue to do um, we, in some time between today and one week from today, about 70,000 pieces of direct mail will hit uh, AARP member households across the state. It's going to discuss very thoroughly all the options that they have uh, to vote in, in, the, in the upcoming general election. Um, and it spells all that stuff out clearly. We work closely with Chris and his team on this mail piece so that we could have similar messaging um, and that we could create a very clear piece for our members to read and use and save um, as they get closer uh, to election day. We are going to repeat that process and in about mid-October drop an additional 70,000 pieces of mail that's member households. So that's 70,000 households that will receive. It's more members than that with two in, in the house. That will be a little bit more focused on the vote by mail piece, although they'll have a lot of the same messages, but that piece will also include sort of a, a very uh, clear, this is, if you're if you're choosing to vote by mail, here are, here are the instructions on how to do that. And, and all of our pieces are providing direct access uh, via the web to the Secretary of State's office. Um, so that'll be 140,000 pieces of mail between now and election day. Um, in addition to that, the AARP bulletin, for those of you that are unfamiliar, that's our monthly news magazine, uh, newspaper, not a broadsheet, but uh, sort of a smaller fold that goes to all of our members. So that will hit every single member household in early October. I think the second Tuesday that will drop. That will have all this information as well. Um, so we feel very good about using the mail, assuming that it moves well, uh, which so far at least appears to be, um, in reaching our members with sort of three big waves of written communication about how to do this. We are a lot more concerned about our members um, sort of 75 to 78 and older the feedback that we've received from some of them who are either unfamiliar or have not voted by mail before or are very concerned about the virus and have taken real precautions and want to protect themselves and are uh, nervous and scared about that. So we're, we're going to be preparing something more targeted and more uh, direct, directly 
deal with that sort of older section of our member population. We're working on that piece right now. That will also be another direct mail piece, but it won't go out as broadly as the first two. Um, we're gonna be um, also really paying close attention. I'm hoping to link up with a colleague of mine in Washington state who is starting, a, a, about to roll out a really interesting program on misinformation and voting, focusing on uh, the, a lot of the stuff that we've seen targeting older voters. He has a partnership that he has um, with the Center for Public Information at the University of Washington. And um, I've spent most of today and I'll spend most of the rest of the week trying to figure out how we can ignite the large numbers of AARP members in the state to look for very simple things if they're active in Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or any of the social feeds about how to detect bogus, um, uh, uh, bogus messages about what can and can't be done, particularly around voting here in Vermont. I've already found a few examples and that didn't take me very long. Um, so I'm hoping that, that we're gonna be able to do something that way. And if not, we're certainly gonna at a minimum uh, run this stuff by the Secretary of State um, and also use Snopes and other sort of very credible online uh, outlets to make sure that we can debunk this stuff. Um, this is a major concern of ours, not just in Vermont, but nationally. Um, and that's another effort that we, we hope to bring to the table. The question is, is, with how much time we have left, how robust it can be. Um, and then I just think finally, I would say that um, you know, we're, I, I feel like um, from what we've been hearing back from our members, I, the mail piece does not seem to be overwhelming them in, you know, uh, in any kind of way that uh, they don't seem to be concerned that their votes won't be counted, that they're, that the mail won't arrive. And we're not, or we're certainly not hearing from them. Well, a couple, but certainly not hearing from them any sort of wild conspiratorial theories about this uh, particular action uh, for po folks participating um, uh, in, in, in this election upcoming, which has been very heartwarming for us, frankly. Uh, and again, we think uh, tackling some of this misinformation will be helpful that way. Uh, and then finally, um, you know, I agree with a lot of what Paul said on the back end. I don't know what can be done about that right now. Um, our biggest concern, frankly, at this point is to have a safe and secure election. Um, and uh, we're committed to continuing to work with this committee and with the Secretary of State and with great organizations like VPIRG to make that happen. Thanks everybody for your time. Greg, I'm gonna ask you a question before we go and then I'll see if anybody else has questions for you and then we'll go to Chris. Or, or, or questions for Paul, and then we'll go to Chris for um, some responses to the two suggestions that were made by Paul. Well, I I don't use social media. I'm I'm a, a throwback, I guess. Yep. But um, what what kinds of misinformation is have you seen in Vermont, and do you have any idea where it's coming from? Well, okay, let me answer that in two ways. First, the misinformation, some of the misinformation that we've seen, some of it both uh, sort of Twitter and Facebook, we found a few pieces. Um, it is uh, one uh, clearly states that um, if, your, um, if your ballot is not postmarked by a specific date, and this date was arbitrarily picked at about October 25th, I think your ballot won't count. Uh, which is just an absolute complete falsehood. And then there are others that are a little more amorphous than that, but are all about trying to discourage people um, to vote from mail, that it's unsafe, that it's fraudulent. There'll be people will be double counted, triple counted. Um, but the one I spoke of uh, first is the kind that we're most concerned about because if that seeps into the system and gets thrown around in social and people pick it up and it gets amplified, um, that can be a very, very dangerous uh, thing for people to believe is true. One of the reasons why I'm trying to see if I can link up with this project in Washington, which I'm hopeful about is that it's these two really brilliant data scientists and what they're able to do is find the origin of the tweet and the origin of the post. So they can take that all the way back to the source. And usually when you take that kind of thing all the way back to its original sourcing, you can find a bad actor and you're able to amplify it in a way um, that is um, uh, very powerful to people. 
Now, uh, I'm hoping that we're going to be able to do that, but at a minimum, we will certainly take uh, tweets and Facebook posts and Instagram posts like that and put them on our feeds and categorically call them out for um, for the for the for the untruths that they are, and we'll do that with also again using Snopes or some other very credible online fact checking vehicle. The Washington Post has been doing a bit of this recently, just to provide some extra credibility to make people uh, sure that you know our our concern is is that this becomes like a political football, um, and we have to sort of rid ourselves of of as much of that as we possibly can. This has not really been done a lot before, so there isn't a whole lot to sort of benchmark it to. Um, but like the first tweet, Madam uh, Chair, that I that I referenced about saying if it wasn't postmarked by October 25th, I think is what it said. That is just a simple untruth that the Secretary of State's office can verify, that VPER can verify, that members of the legislature can credible people and credible institutions in our state uh, can verify those things. Um, but this is happening. I don't think it is happening here as much as it is probably in battleground states that are much more pushed toward the presidential election. But it definitely, was, uh, this briefing that I was a part of yesterday was showing it is happening in states that are, that are gonna be doing a lot of mail-in voting. And that would definitely put us in that category. Thank you, thank you. Um, any other questions here? Should we go to Chris to respond to the, Allison, did you? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm just having a 95 year old mother who's very eager to vote um, and not being, while we're in COVID, not having the, the, the Board of Civil Authority being able to go in normally as they do to assisted living places. Uh, I hope you're, you have some plan working with senior centers, assisted living places, all, all of your constituents um, you have a wide range from 50 to 100, <laughs> and uh, you know they 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 are going to need additional help, and yeah. so are so are the people who run those facilities. And um, I I I'm anyway I'm I'm fairly concerned about that group. I'd like to respond to Senator Clarkson. That's a really important point, and I neglected to point that out. We are preparing um, a special letter, which are going to nursing home administra administrators, uh, folks, uh, folks that lead assisted living facilities, folks in adult residential care homes. I'd be happy to share that uh, to the committee once that letter is done and approved. Um, but we're going directly to staff and administrators in those facilities uh, to provide them the information that we're providing all of our members as well. Our members, if they have an address at an assisted living facility, they'll get our stuff, but we're gonna double back and be talking with professional staff and reaching out to them as well. Thanks. We could also, um, legislators themselves could send a letter to nursing homes. And um, I know in Brattleboro, for example, it isn't the BCA that all that goes out, it's the activities director that actually helps people do the voting and yeah and we're so, targeting senior centers and meal sites any right. places that are really connected to particularly again that for us that sort of older cohort of our aarp population which we're right. sort of looking at at 78 and above right now well but, uh, the, the that places are right it's going to be the activities directors who are yeah. going to be yeah. who are going to probably be organizing this yeah. and so it's key, uh, Greg, to get them looped in as well as the directors of these facilities. Yep, thank you, Senator. But we also can inform people that uh, um, whether it's by a letter, I mean, how many uh, uh, facilities do we have in our counties? Not that many. That's right. Maybe 10 or 15. Oh. oh, in Windsor County, I've got more than that. <laughs> I mean, just right here in Woodstock, I have three, uh, three. Yeah, you have an excellent senior center in Woodstock as well. Yeah, but I'm not, I'm not even talking about senior centers. I'm right, talking, but we're talking about where they live. Yeah. But their connectivity to that environment we see is, is really important. So yeah, we're gonna be getting to all those places. Um, and again, we're putting that piece together um, yep. sometime. Great. Good, 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 good. good. So Chris, would you like to respond to the two suggestions that came from Paul, but that Greg agreed with? 
Sure. And then we'll move on to the general election. Okay, sounds good. Um, just real quick, I want to say I'm really glad that Greg is focusing on this misinformation and disinformation. That's something we had flagged as our main concern coming into 2020 until all the other concerns came up uh, right up next to it. <laughs> many other things, we are worried about that disinformation online um, and people being susceptible to it and having it affect their ability to vote. Uh, so looking forward to working with Greg on that. And I will say thank you, thank you, thank you to the partners who are helping us get the word out. I education and outreach is something we really need to do as, as voting changes a little bit for this year. And we're a small staff with, um, we really don't have the ability to do it all to reach out to all the different populations that need reaching out to. So we rely on those partners and Deeperg and AARP are two of, of many who've done a really great job working with us. We have a big list of people, regular meetings, uh, trying to help get the word out and educate voters and, and spread the word about voting in 2020. So we're, we're thankful for our partners for sure. Um, on the two issues that Paul raised, you definitely agree these are, are, are worthy of our attention and it is a tragedy anytime someone's vote doesn't count. You know, we had some of those instances in the primary where it's just heartbreaking to talk to somebody who realizes I didn't sign my ballot or, I mean, I didn't sign my certificate envelope or I forgot to send my unvoted ballots back in and they're just distraught on the phone with you or online or whatever saying, is my vote really not gonna count? And we don't want that to, to see that happen with anyone. We wanna get that number down to zero, even though that's, that's not completely realistic. So it's a worthy goal and it's terrible when you hear about it and we should address it, but we're just very reluctant to do anything about you know, curative provisions or changing that date of election day at 7 p.m. to a postmark date um, this year. We, we just can't put more on our team, on town clerks, as far as election changes go this year. And there are other issues that are problematic with respect to curative provisions and postmarks. Not everything gets postmarked. Um, there are you know, time delays that, that factor in that you have to account for. I'm not saying it's not doable. I do think we ought to, and the Secretary of State agrees with this, we should take a look at those going forward, but um, please don't deal with them right now on top of everything else that we're having to deal with. Any questions about that? Well, we have we do are keeping some kind of a list of things that we might be looking at. Whoever is back in the next session, that we might be looking at for permanent, more permanent changes. Good. So we'll put that on the list. Yeah, we'll have a lot of material for that list. I think. I bet. <laughs> okay, do you want to move on to the general election and? Sure. Just my notes up here again. So for the general, um, of course, we've turned immediately from completing the primary to moving right on to the general. Um, mailing is going to start going out the week of September 21st. So we're talking less than a month from now. And, you know, as we've spoken about this over the last several months with you, you know, our focus has always been on ensuring that no Vermonter has to choose between their health and their right to vote. And we've been really fortunate that in August, you know, we didn't have a huge spike. Vermont's been, been fairly lucky, no significant outbreaks. But we, when we were dealing with this back in March and, and moving forward, we've had no way of knowing what the future is going to bring. So we are constantly preparing for the worst and, and hoping for the best here. So as part of that, we took that um, authority that you granted us to mail every active registered voter a ballot. And as you know, a prepaid, pre-addressed return envelope. And our hope in doing that is that many, many Vermonters will take advantage of this and will vote by mail, keeping polling places manageable. Um, will is not here today to, uh, because here are just a few of the things that he's working on just today. Um, he's got a long list. And one of the things he's doing today is assisting with the Chittenden Senate recount. And of course, that has to be done very quickly and in a COVID safe way so we can get all of our ballots finalized in order to meet the printing deadline for those ballots that are going out in less than a month. 
So right now he and his team are creating and reviewing some 275 different ballot styles. And those have to be finalized before we send them to the printers. We're also working with our vendor to prepare that mass mailing of ballots to make sure we pull the right lists and we match them up to the right ballots. Again, all has to be done and, and ready to go in less than a month. We're finalizing the envelopes and the instructions and the designs that will go with the mailing. Uh, we're figuring out the logistics of getting some additional drop boxes to towns that want them. Um, a number of towns do want to either improve upon the drop boxes they already ordered for this year or already had in place or perhaps purchase new ones. And uh, one of the other things that we did today was we had a, a, a great meeting with a group of clerks uh, in which we got some very valuable feedback, including one of the, one of the clerks that's on the call here today. Um, that's just, you know, that's a typical day for us right now as we kind of, that we're 10 weeks out from the general election. So there is a lot of logistics to handle. Um, I think, as you know, we decided to centralize this mailing and, and you heard a little bit about it today already because we think that's the most efficient way to get this task done and to avoid overwhelming all of the clerks with the ballot requests that will be coming in, would be coming in constantly up until November 3rd if we didn't centralize that mailing and do it proactively as soon as the ballots are ready to go. So, you know, the other thing that we've briefly touched on, we've seen news about possible postal service slowdowns. <clears throat> we haven't seen it. Excuse me. Drink. We haven't seen it in Vermont, and we're, we're fairly confident that, that we aren't going to see slowdowns in Vermont. We have um, a specific point person, a specific contact that's been um, from the post office we've been dealing with on a daily basis. Um, we've had a lot of reassurances. Um, we're still being very mindful and watchful that that slowdown doesn't happen, but we, um, we think Vermont's gonna be okay with, with that respect, but we are still encouraging people to vote early, to leave at least seven to 10 days uh, for your ballot to get back in the mail. But you know, one of the great things is by proactively sending this out at least you know, 45 days out from the election, we're eliminating one of those trips back and forth for a request or for the ballot to get to the voter. Um, so those ballots will be in the hands of Vermonters just as soon as they're available with ample time to return them. You should have about a month uh, to, to get your ballot back to your clerk. And how you return that ballot is going to be up to you. Uh, again, by mail is one way. It's going to be pre-addressed and postage paid, and we recommend seven to 10 days um, for, for getting that back to your clerk by the mail. You can bring it back in person. So by Dropbox, if your clerk has one or delivery to your town clerk, and we always say, check with your town clerk first to see what their hours are and availability to come drop that off. Or you can get it back on election day, no later than 7 p.m. when all of the polls close. And then lastly, if people wanna vote in person, they can still vote in person. Our hope is that it's not uh, very many people voting in person, but that's still up to you. Some people have to vote in person. Some people really want to vote in person. Um, so, you know, we're going to allow for that, of course. Um, so our, me our message out to the public and our, our message today is, you know, first of all, register to vote. Be sure your address is up to date um, and make a voting plan. And we hope that that plan is to vote early and, and to vote by mail or to know how you're going to return your ballot by 7 p.m. on election day. Um, so that's a, a, a very quick rundown of what we're, we're looking at. It's, a, it's a, a million things a day. We're, we're really out straight for a long time, and we're really lucky to have an elections team that really loves their work and is dedicated uh, to, to what they're doing and dedicated to serving Vermonters and, and uh, really passionate about elections. Because if they weren't, I think we would have lost them a long time ago. We've really pushed them to the edge these last several months, and now we still have a, a couple of months to go. Um, with that, I'll stop and I'll you know answer any questions anyone might have about the general election. Brian, thank you, Madam Chair. So, Chris, um, you said the mailing would be going out by September 21st. Can I assume that if everything's working properly, voting itself could start by around the 23rd or so? 
In other words, if it takes a couple of days to get to the voter and they fill it out the first chance they get and put it back, I'm just sort of trying to get a sense of when early voting uh, would begin. I'm guessing around the 23rd. Yes, Senator, that's a that's a pretty good assumption. It's a huge mailing, so it's going to start on the 21st. And uh, I think with the postcards, it went alphabetically by town. So it, it takes a couple of days. So depending on where you are in the alphabet, you might get yours by the 23rd. You might get yours maybe a week later. Our goal is to get them all out by October 1st. And I'll also just note that overseas and military will get theirs um, first, and that starts uh, – September 19th, I think. And a, a voter could still request an absentee ballot, correct? You can still request an absentee ballot. What's going to happen is when those are all uh, mailed out, you're going to be flagged as having requested an absentee ballot in our system. Yep. We do know already that there are 140,000 pending requests already in our system. On the postcard, you can you could select for the primary and for the general. Some people have already selected to have absentee ballots for the entire year. Uh, so we know there's already 140,000 that are in there. Um, but everyone else is going to get every active registered voter will get a ballot and will be flagged as having requested. Those that come in, <coughs> perhaps new voters, people who've moved, um, will uh, you will request and we're, we're looking at how to segregate those. The town clerks will be responsible. We're sending out ballots for newly registered voters after the mailing happens and people who move and do a request after the mailing happens. I want to thank Carol too for the information you uh, provided with respect to the uh, three to 500 that you said you've got. I, I thought that was very helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Chris Bray, did you have a comment? Yeah, I think I heard most of the answer already. Um, from Chris Winters, the, but what's, so 45 days is uh, what date? Is like the 25th, 23rd, where, are, where is that on the calendar? I think that's the 19th, Senator, but don't quote me, it's right around there. All right, thank you. So I, I do, I think it is really important to, as Brian just pointed out this, um, that people who have been challenged will not get a ballot and they would have the ability then when they get their challenge letter to go into the town clerk mm -hmm. and say i am still here i'm not dead and i haven't moved <laughs> i still want to vote and then they can get their ballot so but i think it's important that people know that that um those people who are challenged will not be getting a ballot chris bray did you have a comment uh, well yeah so uh is that challenge for returned Sorry, I just want to make sure I have this clear. Was this, is this going to be town by every town that received a bounced return to postcard will automatically challenge or that's a town by town decision? Hey, Carol can probably speak to this better than I can, but I think that's a, a town clerk and BCA decision on whether they want to use that returned right. card as grounds for challenging voters. It, okay. it is a town by town decision. Um, however, there has there was um, recommendations coming out of the elections division at the Secretary of State's office that this would be a good opportunity uh, to use the returned postcards to do such a challenge. Um, and there's been a lot of talk on our uh, municipal clerk and treasurer association listserv about the benefits of doing that. So I, I know of quite a few clerks who are doing this, taking the same actions that I took. Okay. Um, the other qu quick question is, so is one form of voting actually eliminated and that is walking into your town clerk during the 45 day period, requesting a ballot in person and voting, is that still available or not? And you'll just be flagged as already have voted. It, it is available, but it's, it's a little modified because you're already going to have been sent a ballot. So you can keep that ballot, you can fill it out and put it in the envelope, and you're basically voting absentee even though you're handing it to your right. clerk. I suppose you could, you could still show up and say, I want to, Carol, maybe help me out here. That you, I want to show up. I want to I actually vote right there, and I want to see you take it out of my hand. I don't, I don't know. Well, there certainly could be people who want to walk into your office and register to vote right then and there. They've just moved in from out of state and they want to vote um, 
at while they're there. Um, however, uh, Senator Bray, not every clerk's office is currently open right. to the public. Um, right. Barry City Hall is not. We're working here, but we're we're not open to the public. Um, so access to in-person voting, early voting, uh, will be ba town by town based on what their current situation is under COVID. Okay, and now you've raised, yet yeah, there's a lot of permutations to this thing. For, so for the person who just moved in and their town clerk's not open, how are they gonna go about registering to vote? They, um, in our instance, because we've had people that we've been dealing with since before the primary, um, what we have done is we have uh, driven people to the um, online voter registration page, which is available, yep. uh, so they can uh, register online. Uh, we have mailed applications to them with a, a postage paid envelope for them to fill out the the application and mail it back to us, or they can drop it in our Dropbox. Um, there are a number of different ways that, that we've helped, uh, we've been able to try to accommodate them uh, yeah. and their yeah. need to register. Great, well, you know, other people have already said it, but I'll chime in as well. Thank you so much for, there's been a tremendous amount of work. I'd say it'd be very hard for me to imagine anyone in Vermont doesn't know that uh, government in Vermont wants to make it as easy and safe as possible for you to vote. So thanks. So uh, I'm going to, um, right now I'm gonna, Thomas, I know you're with us on the phone. Did you have any comments you'd like to share? And I don't know if you can unmute yourself or if Gail has to unmute you. There you are. I can do that. Okay. Um, I, that. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for letting me participate. I have no questions. I think some of the questions and issues I'd been thinking of have already been discussed uh, here in the hearing. So I'll mute myself back up again and, and listen some more. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you for being here with us. Um, anybody else have any Questions, concerns, suggestions, um, Allison? Uh, I, I just wanted to reiterate the, the question I think our town clerks had was on the DMV coordination. Are you working with DMV closely? I mean, are people, that, that seemed to be a little bit of a hiccup, at least in our neck of the woods. Um, there was... You know, that's always the classic, oh, I registered with DMV and it doesn't show up and stuff like that. That's one concern is the DMV. And the other one is particularly during COVID and with all the challenges we face, uh, I would hope people would be thoughtful about same day voter registration, uh, showing up at quarter of seven for th that whole thing is really, a, I, I think a challenge for, for many town clerks, particularly now and this year. So I, I don't know if we want to include uh, any kind of thoughtfulness message, but um, uh, I think having what you said, Chris, is having a voting plan uh, and being thoughtful about that voting plan with, with clerks who are already have a huge amount of extra work, what is really uh, important. Yeah, thank, thank you, Senator. On the DMV issue, we get a nightly upload from them on any, any new registrations, any address changes. So I, I guess I'd have to see the specifics to know okay. what was what was going glitchy there. Um, yeah, having a voting plan is, is really important. We try not to uh, promote election day registration uh, uh, too much leading up to the election, and then you know, but because we know it can be difficult for town clerks. But that's always a backup for someone who who shows up on election day for whatever reason their registration isn't showing up or. Um, you know, the, the, I think the better news here is that people are really engaged. We're seeing more participation than ever. Yep. Um, our registration numbers in Vermont are really high, which is great. Thanks to automatic voter re registration. Thanks to work of a lot of um, groups trying to get people registered, reaching out. Um, you know, the fact that inmates can, can vote in the state of Vermont. We've got a lot, a lot of uh, things going for us to drive our registration numbers up really high. And I'll just point out real quick, uh, a little plug for us that, you know, two years ago, we were ranked number one in, in the country on the election performance index by MIT. That's the coveted one that all the election 
geeks try to get. Uh, their ratings came out again uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we did drop out of first place, but we're still in third place, which is pretty good. Number three in the country. Who beat uh, us? Uh, Minnesota. You're, you're well, over. yeah. Oh, that's right. And North Dakota. Oh, sure. My two, my two <laughs> states. <laughs> and it just might be interesting for the committee to know that if you go to mvp.vermont.gov to your My Voter page, you can track your ballot. So you can actually go in there and see if your ballot has been returned. You can see if it's been marked effective. And that's when, then we, when we start getting the phone calls. Um, you can see that it's been um, mailed out to you. So mvp.vermont.gov gives you, and you can see a sample ballot. You can um, update your, your um, voting information, where you want your ballot mailed, all that right, right there at mvp.vermont.gov. And Chris, could you just clarify what, what we're number, th what, what it means? I mean, number one in the country or number three in the country in what aspect of voting? Yeah, they call it elections performance. It's a whole, whole bunch of different data but it does include the things like voter turnout, online uh, tools that are available to voters, time spent standing in line. We do really, really well there, less than a minute on, on <laughs> compared to some states where it can be, it can be hours, you know, tragically. It can be yeah. hours you have to stand in line on election day. Um, so a whole variety of factors, um, and we, we turned up number three this year. Great, congratulations. Oh. Chris Bray, did you have a question? Yeah, I'm guessing next time around, you're going to be back to number one based on what's going on th around here this year. Here, here. That's what we're always shooting for. <laughs> Did anybody else have any questions or comments? Oh, Anthony and then Paul. Yeah, just two quick things. I think, first of all, given the work you all had to do on the primary, the general election is going to be a breeze compared to yeah. what you had to <laughs> primary. So I appreciate all the hard work. I was curious, though. So, I heard about this thing, and I'm not sure what exactly it was. It's called True the Vote, something out of Texas that was sort of sent to the town clerks the day before the election and implied that they were going to have to provide a lot of different information and whatnot. Can you just tell me what that was about? Sure. It's, it, it was a public records request and, and had a lot to do, I think, with um, election data that they're looking for, sent to all the town clerks. Um, we had a bunch of calls on it as well. And right, you know, the day before the election. So, you know, of course, they're not going to be able to reply to it right away. It's a lot of information that we can respond to. So our advice to them was to um, respond, but to say that the Secretary of State's office would be responding to the majority of the information that they're looking for. I think we can reply to all of it. I immediately reached out to them, asked for an extension of time, said as the records officer for the Secretary of State's office, we would be responding on behalf of all the town clerks. I have not yet responded to that, um, and I did not actually get a response back to my email. So, so I, is it a real thing? It's a real so, thing, and they're doing yeah. it for all 50 states. Okay. Thanks. Paul? Um, Chris's mention of the My Voter page and the opportunity for people to track their ballot was just a, um, another reminder for me as, as I was discussing before the opportunity to potentially cure your ballot. Um, I understand that uh, Chris's explanation that, he's, that the Secretary of State will not require clerks this time. And I, I want to be clear, I, I understand that. I don't disagree with that rationale. I think what we may be left with, though, is a... Um, uh, uh, a patchwork of different responses that clerks may give to citizens who track their ballot and may find that um, that it hasn't been counted, that it has been declared defective, uh, for instance. And um, uh, so, uh, and there may be nothing that we can do about that, that you get a different response in Burlington than you do in Brattleboro. But I think one thing that the Secretary of State's office should, should uh, advise uh, would be for each office to to have consistency in the way they respond to people who are uh, inquiring about their own defective ballots. And if two people have the same defect, that is that they both forgot to sign the envelope, the response to them about the opportunity to cure that defect at that place should be the same. Uh, otherwise, of course, we run the risk of 
if, if you're treating different people differently, that that, that could raise uh, valid concerns um, for folks. I hope the response isn't then, therefore we do nothing to allow any defects to be cured, but, it, but at least uh, I think you could have, in other words, a consistent response that is more than just no um, to, to everybody who inquires about it. So I think that there could be, uh, without a blanket requirement and a lot more work for all clerks, at least something to be said, some guidance to be offered about uh, the need for consistency and, and uh, perhaps encouragement to at least respond favorably, if, even if they are not proactively reaching out to voters to say, hey, you've got a problem with your ballot. If somebody tracks their ballot on the My Voter page, sees there's a defect, inquires about it, there I think we need to have some sort of consistent um, responses within those offices. Thank you. Betsy Ann. Hi, I'm just, I had been, been curious about what the law says in this regard because um, the defective ballot statute 17 BSA 2547 does provide that if upon examination by the election officials, it appears that any of these number of things happen, um, the ballot shall not be counted and marked defective. And one of those is that the certificate is not signed separately the return of ballot statute which is 17 bsa 2543 subsection b reads once an early voter absentee ballot has been returned to the clerk in the envelope with the signed certificate it shall be stored in a secure place and shall not be returned to the voter for any reason um, so the general rule is to not return to the, the ballot to the voter for the for any reason. What's an interesting part of the law is that it's returned in the envelope with the signed certificate. So I think we could put that at least on the list for a potential legislative um, uh, review at some other point. Um, but reading those together, I, I just question whether a, a clerk could return the ballot to the voter once it's once the clerk receives the ballot back. Chris, do you have any, or Carol? I, it, it's interesting, the, the, um, the one comment that I would say, because I would love to find a, a way to repair defect with regards to defective ballots. It's heartbreaking every time as we're opening them and processing them that we find the defective ones. My biggest concern would be, um, regarding process. Um, how do I reach out to the voter? How do I let them know? And how do I do that consistently across all my voters? Yeah, that's what I was gonna say as well, Carol, that Paul's comment is, is dead on, I think, in that yep. you want voters to be treated consistently. And with defects, you know, it, clerks may handle them slightly differently <clears throat> right now when they enter them, you know, what kind of notice they give back to people that the ballot is defective. So that's, that presents a real challenge um, and something to look at. Yeah. Well, any more questions or comments or concerns? I just have to say that, um, actually, I, I, you know I love this committee and I love the issues. And I think that this committee um, over the years has worked really hard with, in cooperation with the Secretary of State's office and the town clerks and advocacy groups to remove as many barriers as possible to allow people to vote. And while we'll probably never get it perfect and never get everybody there, I, I think that the effort um, from the town clerks and the secretary of state's office and the advocacy groups has been just remarkable. And um, we should be really proud of that. Here, 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 here. Really extraordinary this year. So any other um, questions, concerns, issues, anything else? Um, I have a question for uh, the deputy secretary. I'm wondering if you want to uh, guess what our participation rate will be in the general election. Oh, oh good idea. We could have a bet for everybody. I, I thought the question might be about getting a haircut. That was where I was going to go, but no. <laughs> um, what are you hoping for? <laughs> I don't even dare to venture a guess. 
I would, I would love to see twice the, the turnout that we had for the primary. And so that would, you know, put us at somewhere around 340,000, 350,000 out of 450,000. Yeah. It's going to be, it was, I was just going to say, does it get, does it get us past 70%? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Slightly. All right. Thank you. Uh, what, what the, and what's the highest we've had, Chris, uh, of voter participation? Wasn't it in 08? Yeah, 08 was a big year. I think it, that might have been the record. I don't know off the top of my head. I, I want to say, uh, I, I don't know for sure. But yeah. And, up but and it to the committee. Have, have we ever broken 80%? I don't believe so. That, that's just shocking, given that we send people to die for this right. It's just amazing to me that we fight for this right, that we all honor it and applaud it, and yet can't be bothered to go and vote. Yep. And now we're making it super easy. So we all, in every town, we should have one of those things, like a thermometer, and oh. fill it up. And so everybody is like super aware of how many people have voted, you know, uh, particularly early ballots in, and, you know, get people to, a visual reminder that they need to vote. Just one more thing that the clerks can take on <laughs> the day before the election. <laughs> oh, that could be other people. Right. So, so we, one year, Waybridge got like 81% back when I was a House member. They, oh. Wow. I asked Secretary Markowitz to create an award for the municipality that had the highest participation rate. It's just sort of a PR, you know, little friendly competition and help get the word out there. But um, maybe it's time for, a, I'll pass that same recommendation along. You could have a, an award for the highest participating town. That's You'll never get idea. it. We have a town here that has three voters. Yeah, there, three there voters. are a few. Uh, Land Grove and Victory always go way high, but they're uh, fairly small, so. Okay, so we'll have a tiered competition. <laughs> <laughs> And I, the other comment I want to make is that I just love seeing Isabel. Well, she's pestering to eat and go outside now. I figured she was, so I'm going to ask if there's anything else we need to do. And if not, we'll see you tomorrow. Great. Right. Thank you. One thirty, right? Uh, yeah. One thirty. One thirty. Thanks. Thank you. you. Bye. Bye.